Okay, so we'll get started. Today's uh, webinar is covering bootloader updates for a couple of the OCS products. Basically, this is the, the lowest level of firmware update that you can use on the OCS range, and it's useful in a few instances if uh, if you manage to, to brick your unit or make it totally unresponsive to any other communication means and, and getting some new baseline firmware in there. So let's get started. Welcome to today's tutorial. Let's get started. So let's have a look at today's agenda. We'll start with a quick review of firmware and we'll discuss the firmware elements and firmware update methods used in the Horner controllers. We'll discuss the bootloader update procedure and its utility and we'll do a demonstration of the bootloader update procedure. As always, We'll finish with a live Q&A session. So let's get started. We'll start with a quick review of the Firmware Updates webinar. Firmware is the code that runs on the OCS hardware that provides it with its functionality and features. Firmware executes the configuration and application program loaded onto the unit by the application designer. There are various different elements to firmware, which we'll discuss now. The first big element is the operating system. All OCS units run an operating system, which varies from product to product. The main code that our engineers have created is the firmware, which is made up of firmware files. We've also got FPGA or CPLD code, which runs in specialized chips that perform high speed counter functions. So that was a quick review of firmware and its elements. There are three different methods for updating firmware in a Horner controller, which vary by the controller you have. If you're using a Micro OCS series product, or the XLE or XLT, you can perform firmware updates over a serial port or a USB port from Seascape. If you're using an XL series product or the XL Plus, you can use a file set that is copied to either a USB drive or a micro SD card and then you would press Upload Bootloader from the unit. If you're using an RCC series product, the only method of updating the firmware is using a bootable micro SD card. The bootable micro SD method can also be used with the XL series and XL Plus as a safe or recovery method. Sometimes firmware updates fail, mostly with the EXL6, EXLW and EXL10. In the event of a failed firmware update, updating from bootable micro SD is a method that is successful in nearly all cases. Now we're going to discuss the bootloader update procedure. Firstly, you would acquire a micro SD card, preferably 32 gigabytes and below. Then, you download the firmware update utility from the Horner website, or alternatively, you can acquire it from tech support. Then, you can run the utility on a PC that supports Windows 7 or later. After that, insert the micro SD card into the OCS. You should back up your program before the update in case of a failure. After the backup, you will press the update button while powering up the OCS. The OCS will then boot from the micro SD card and you will initiate a bootloader update from the OCS. Finally, you just need to reboot the program to see your update. We're currently working on a dedicated Horner Windows app for creating bootloader disks. For now, we've updated our Windows batch file recovery package to utilize a third-party disk utility, which can be acquired from tech support or from the Horner website. To download this package, you will need a Horner Universal login. Now, We'll demonstrate the bootloader update procedure. I've got a pre-release version of the bootloader package downloaded here. We've got a folder here that contains everything that we need. Here is an application called Rufus. Rufus is a third-party application that we're using to handle all the bootloading and formatting for the drives. We'll be executing this to make the Windows batch file, which I'll do now. 
I'll double click on that. We'll get a pop-up panel here with a basic operator interface. The first step is to tell the utility what OCS you're running. In my case, I want to use a bootable microSD for an EXLW. So I'll find it here on the list. I don't need the can open version, I just need the CSCAN version. So I need to type in EXL6EW. So I'll type that in now. Now it's going to ask me for the drive letter for my micro SD. So we'll go to my computer. My micro SD card is installed in drive E. So I'm going to type in E as my drive letter. OK. Now I'll get asked if I want to allow this app to make changes to my device. I'm going to say yes and continue. The first time that I executed the batch file, Windows asked me to validate that I wanted to run the file, so I had to hit the More Info button and then click Run anyway. So that might happen for you, but it didn't happen for me because I've already done that. The Rufus program is now open. I don't have to make any changes to any of these settings because these are pre-configured. So I'll hit the Start button. We'll be warned that we are erasing the data on the disk. I'll say OK, and I'll continue on. So as you can see, it's writing the image here. I'll cut to when it's done. So it's finished writing. Now that we're done with that, we can close this, and the batch file should move on. So it's copying the files that we need to end up on the OCS to the microSD so that the OCS can boot from those files. We have a success, and we can press any key to continue. So we've created this bootable drive that we can put in our OCS to complete the process. Now let's switch to our overhead view. I'm going to show this process for a couple of different controllers. The first one I've got here is an XL4 which is running a serial port application. I'll show you how to recover this unit in case it's been bricked. You have to flip a switch at power up in order to initiate bootloading from the micro SD card. Now, in the case of the XL4, that dip switch is here on the top of the controller. So we've got switch number 1, 2, and 3. And if you go to the user's documentation for the XL4, dip switch 1 is tied to the serial port, dip switch 2 is a spare, and dip switch 3 is factory reserved. The factory reserve switch is the one we want. That's the one that's going to boot up in bootloader mode from the micro SD slot. And since we have installed a memory card that was prepared using the process that I just showed, I can power cycle the OCS. Alright, so I flip the switch. Now I'll power cycle the device and see what happens. At first, we're seeing all kinds of error messages and a boot installer screen. I'll discuss the error messages first. It's normal to get error messages whenever you're doing a firmware update, because part of the firmware update is erasing the application. So you're going to be getting error messages at boot up. So this unit just booted from the micro SD card, however, we have not copied the bootloader files onto the local flash memory of the device so that it can boot on its own next time. Now, to do that, we need to hit the install bootloader button, and then after, we wait for the process to complete. All bootloader updates also update the firmware and the FPGA. This can take a minute or two, so we'll cut to when it's finished. We've just updated the bootloader, and now it's asking us to remove the drive. I'll do that now. I want the unit to boot from its own internal memory, so I need to flip this switch back to its default position, and then power cycle the unit. After flipping that switch, it doesn't matter if my memory card is plugged in or not, it's not going to boot from it without that dip switch in the right position. So now we're booting.
We still got a quick battery error message. The firmware was just updated again, so we still haven't gotten to the point where we're fully done with the update. That battery error is going to go away after a bit of configuration. So now, I'm going to pop my memory card back in. I'm going to go to my system menu, I'm going to go to removable media, and hit enter. Alright. And under PGM, which is a program that I configured before this tutorial, I'm going to load the application into the unit again. This time it's going to ask me if I want to go into run mode, and I'm going to say yes. I'm going to power cycle the unit, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so this time, we didn't have any error for the battery anymore. There were no faults of any kind. My application is back up and running. So that was the bootloader process for the XL4. Now, let's show the process for the EXLW that I started on the PC. I've got an EXLW here. This is our 6-inch controller that is extra screen space instead of dedicated function keys. Let's look at the back of this controller. We've got some dip switches here. If I look in the documentation for the controller, none of these dip switches are dedicated to booting. These dip switches are dedicated to serial port functions, so we can't use them. Okay, so how will we update this controller? Well, if we look at this side, We've got our memory card, we've got our mini USB port, and we have a little opening there with a recessed push button. We're going to use that push button to boot from micro SD. Now, this will be a little bit trickier than before, because it's not just a matter of flipping a switch and plugging it in. We're going to have to hold that button in and then apply power. So we're showing you a more difficult update than before. So what I'm going to do now is have the power ready to go in. I'm using my right hand to push against the unit, and then on this side, I've got a small screwdriver that I'm going to use to push the button in with. It is very easy to feel the tactile feedback on this button, so you will very easily know when this button has been pressed. As I'm pressing it, I'm going to apply power to the unit, and then let go. I accidentally let go a little early because my hand slipped. So we'll see what happens. No, that wasn't successful at all. As you can see, it's booting like normal. So we'll try this again. If you were actually trying to recover a bricked unit, you wouldn't have seen the unit boot. But in my case, I have a unit that doesn't actually need to be recovered. It isn't bricked, it works perfectly fine. So let's try this again. I'll get my right hand ready, I'll press the button with the screwdriver, and then apply power to the unit. I'll flip this over, watch the boot process, and see if I was successful. I was successful this time. It can be a little bit difficult, but it's manageable. So I pushed the button while I powered up, and then I let go of the button after I had applied power. We have effectively booted from microSD. It's ready for us to hit install bootloader, which I'll do now. Once I've pressed that, the controller will take a couple of minutes to install the new firmware, and then it'll be ready for use. So that concludes today's tutorial. Thank you for attending today's tutorial. The Q&A session, session will, will begin, begin shortly. shortly. Okay, folks, I, I hope those uh, videos were useful. Certainly, they're a, a good uh, a good a good way of uh, checking out your own progress if you need to 
update a, a firmware on a unit. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a good reference to, to guide you through the, the steps required. So let's have a look and see if we've got any questions coming in. Um, the default PGM, is that created automatically when you update the bootloader? Uh, I'm afraid it isn't. No, you need to go into the into the system menu, into the removable media screen and, and uh, back up your program before starting the the um, update bootloader, unless, of course, you've got it saved away handily anyway. Um, OK. Um, I've got another question in. Which firmware version installs this utility? How can we actualize the files in the tool? Um, the, the package for this is not actually associated with the firmware. It's a separate package. And you can download that from the, the website or, or contact our tech, tech support and they'll get you the file set over to, to do all this. Um, obviously, uh, as different versions come out of the, of the firmware and, and the bootloader, then we, we, we keep these updated fairly frequently in, in terms of you know, having the latest bootloader slash OS and firmware and FPGA images to put onto the, uh, onto the devices. OK. OK, so, uh, so that's the questions. Um, let's have a quick look now at the uh, um, upcoming webinars. So let me share my screen for that. OK, so obviously today we've just uh, done the bootloader updates for, for the OCS, December the 9th. Um, next week, we've got Can Open Networking. Um, basically what it is and, and how to configure an LCS to act as a master or a slave on a can open network and uh, work with various device profiles. Um, we've then got a couple of weeks um, free, um, obviously with Christmas break, so we're not going to bother running one in, uh, immediately before Christmas, between Christmas and New Year or the first one in the New Year. So after the can open one, the, uh, the next two, uh, webinar will be using video um, on January the 13th. We've got a getting started with IEC part two on January the 20th and using the shift register function in Seascape on January the 27th. And we're currently working at the moment on, on scheduling for February. So uh, I would think by the time that we, we produce the can open networking webinar on the 16th, we, we should have a, a bit more of a, a diary going forward than, than we have at the moment. Okay, so Thank you all very much for attending this morning. I hope it's been very useful. As I say, the, the, the video of the webinar should be a useful step-by-step uh, -step guide if you do need to do this uh, firmware update yourself. And uh, as I say, thank you very much. We'll see you all at the next webinar.